Welcome to the Off the Beaten Career Path podcast. I'm your host, Katie Myers. Here you will find the inspiration, strategies, and tactics needed to reach the next level and beyond in your small business and career. Thanks for joining us and get ready to put these ideas to work for you. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Katie Myers, and I am here with an extremely special guest today. Molly Gallmeyer is the Senior Director of the Baker Tilly Digital Professional Sales Organization. Her team sells professional services across a variety of digital solutions, including digital strategy and professional services, data analytics and system governance, cloud and application services, as well as business system consulting services. She was one of the main founders of the Women in Technology South Central Wisconsin chapter and was honored in 2020 as one of In Business Magazine's 40 Under 40 candidates. Welcome, Molly. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. This is exciting. This is very exciting. So Molly is one of my absolute closest best friends in the world, but she also has an incredibly interesting career in a very different sector than than what I work in. I know that you never thought that you would end up in the technology sector. So can you take us through how you ended up where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of crazy. I mean, even thinking back to college, I graduated from UW-Whitewater in 2011, and I went to school for marketing, and I thought I was going to work at an ad agency. And to be honest, the word sales kind of seemed like a yucky word. It felt like used car salesman, or I didn't ever want to do anything in sales. When I started my career, I worked for a for-profit college and I was told that I was going to be helping recruit high school kids and get them into college. And as a recent graduate, I was super excited about the opportunity to promote further education to kids. Lo and behold, I got to training and because it was a for-profit college, they gave me a script and I was essentially selling students to come sign up for school. And so I kind of fell into sales and then further two years later, I fell into technology to your point. So I started in the IT staffing world. And for those who may or may not know a ton about staffing, it is one of the most challenging, but I think a really great boot camp for those starting out in any sort of sales role. The metrics are incredibly high and challenging, so much so I think we had to make 150 calls a week, 20 meetings, in-person meetings a week. It was really extreme, but it also taught me that kind of hustle and grit, and you got to kind of sit your butt in that seat until the job gets done. And so with that, and through my network in staff, Staffing, I had met an individual who was starting a data and analytics company in late 2014. The company was starting in January 2015. And I thought, wow, this data analytics thing, we really continue to see it a ton on the staffing side of the house. This seems interesting. So I had met with the two co-founders in March of 2015 tried to sell them staffing solutions and they kind of flipped the script and said, why don't you come work for us? And I always tease because my parents were like, who are these two guys you're going to go work for? I took a decent pay cut, all those things. But I just thought, you know what? Now or never, I was at the right age and right time in my career to take the risk. So I did it. I helped them build what was then called Talvon until 2020 when Baker Tilly bought us and acquired us. And to your original statement, Katie, now I don't know that I could see myself doing anything other than technology. In my role today, I don't get to sell as much and I'm not as hands-on anymore, but still being educated in all of the different changes, and the systems and the processes and, you know, as many times as we probably hear AI now and all of those things that are coming down the funnel, it's extremely interesting to me. And I love the constant change. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't actually know that, that you took a pay cut to go to Talavant. I've done that in my career. My husband's done it as well. It's obviously paid off for you, but why did you feel that was a good decision? What gave you the confidence to take that leap? Yeah, so I have a lot of credit to give to my now husband, then boyfriend. So he had been working at his uncle's company for years before he did something similar, took a pay cut, worked for a company that he later purchased. And so he gave me that confidence. And I'll never forget, his parents have a condo down in Dunedin, Florida, and we were in Florida for that week. And it's funny how life works, right? Being removed from my IT staffing world in the hustle and bustle. And for me to sit there for a week and really reflect and decide, is this right for me? Should I do this? Helped. The other thing is my brother is very, very entrepreneurial. So I leaned in on him a lot and he was all for it because he is a little bit younger than me, but had been starting his own businesses since he was super young. And so again, him giving me that confidence of, 
if this doesn't work, you're well networked, you'll figure it out and you'll find it. But the one thing about staffing, again, that I'll promote is that they also pay you a decent amount at a young age. So what I was making at 25 years old, people don't see for many years later in their lifetime. And so again, going to the startup, I don't have a clean office space. I mean, I tease, we were in like class C office space in Madison. It wasn't the nicest thing, no pictures, nothing. So I leave Robert Half, which is a very corporate, well-known organization with money and healthy bonuses to here you go. Here's your base, which is 25K lower. Oh, and by the way, you probably won't sell anything for a year because we're a brand new company. There are longer sales cycles. And so, I mean, I didn't get my first bonus till probably... 14, 15 months in. And actually I was going to Orange Theory at the time where I met you, which was a hundred something a month. And I remember being like, can I continue to even pay for this? Because I was living very paycheck to paycheck compared to what I was at at Robert Half. So long-winded answer, but yeah, it was a, a huge reality check for me and also forced me to say, okay, if I don't sell anything, no one's going to make this up for me. And again, my, my husband helped support as far as like splitting rent and stuff, but it's not like he had all this access to funds either. And so we just kind of had to hustle and figure it out. Absolutely. Were you questioning that decision right after you made it for a while, especially if you didn't start making money for quite a while? What was that like emotionally after you made the change? So one thing that's really, really cool, and Dave DeVarney is the individual who was the president of that company. He's now a partner within Bigger Tilly, but I will never forget. And again, if you're a Madison native, it was June, 2016. So it had been 14-ish months later, and we sat at the Great Dane. I hadn't sold anything over cheese curds and a beer, and I cried to him. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, my checking account is swindling down. I still have student loans. I have a car payment, right? I have all of these things. And I had done the activity that he knew was going to result to sales. So if you're familiar with sales, there's a ton of stuff that happens leading up to the actual sell, especially in a consulting type organization. There are a lot longer sales cycles. It's not transactional. And so some of my clients, the ones that I am reaping the benefits for now, I had to talk to for three years before I saw a dollar out of what came out of that. And so with that, I was fortunate that he gave me a small bump. I think it was like 5K or something, which in reality, like, what is that on a paycheck, 50, 75 bucks? But it it showed me that trust that like, okay, they trust me. We're in this together. We're going to do it. And I think I just had to change my lifestyle, right? And so I eliminated certain things. I still was working out at the gym, but I often, a lot of my close friends know I tease about the years when I would yell at my husband because him and his buddies would eat two frozen pizzas in a night and $4 a Jack's pizza adds up. So, <laughs> it, you know, I mean, it was, those were the fights we got in back in the day or you had four Mountain Dews, a 12 pack, six bucks, you know, like it was just that type of, we had to really budget. Fortunately, we were renting. We didn't own a home or anything at that point. Our rent was fairly low. And so we just did what we had to do until I started to see some of those benefits of of commissions come through. I know one of the things that you're super passionate about is the that you got to get out there and work your ass off for the things that you want. And you've obviously done that. But what lessons have you learned from that over the years as you have built your career? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the big thing, and I don't know if this is good or bad, I have an amazing family and amazing supportive parents, but I've also been taught like, it's on me. It's not on my husband. It's not on mom and dad. It's not on my friends. Like I have to figure it out. And especially when it comes to finances. And this is also why sales is a great career for me, right? I have that control and those levers to push and play of how much I make a year. I'm not in a salary. You make this much. It doesn't matter how good you do. It doesn't matter how bad you do. And so I chose that career, you know, strategically as I got into it and started learning more about sales and commissions of, okay, I like this. I want to stay in this one. But two, I think it also was just that mindset of like, I have to do it. I have to figure it out. He's kind of a controversial character. But in my early days of selling, I listened to a lot of Grant Cardone. And if you know him or you know anything about his methodology, he's very much hustle, get it done, make the phone call, spend the nights, not weekends. I mean, it's nice that now I still have really long days and I still have stuff, but you know, there'll be a Friday and it's two o'clock and I can go to happy hour because I put in that hustle nature in in the first 10, 12 years of my career. I have a, a seller who's down in Milwaukee who reports to me and it's cool because I was at an event with him 
two weeks ago and he's like, you are really well known in the Milwaukee market. And he's like, and everyone has the utmost respect because of your hustle. And I was like, oh, cool. Thanks. Right. Like I, I didn't know that, but that was me. I was everywhere. If there was an event, there was the girl with the curly hair selling data and analytics at anything and everything I could be. And I think you just have to have that mindset of, you know, no one's going to do it for you. And unfortunately in today's world, I think there's a lot of coddling and a lot of baiting around like that hardworking mentality. I mean, even at Baker Tilly, we're fortunate to have disconnect days and mental health days and all that. But at the end of the day, like people still have to work hard, right? I, I equate it to, to weight loss or other things. Like if you don't put the effort in, it's not going to happen. And I think I've always looked at work in that same mindset. Yeah, that was in the years that I was really building my career. I had a, a boss who would be like, oh, if you hit this goal, like I'll give you an all expenses paid vacation. I was like, I don't want it because I'm going to miss out on the commissions. If I'm gone for a week or two, I have got to do that. And I think it's like there's some dangerous attitudes about that now. We're in a place with our careers where we've both been doing this for a number of years and we can kind of start pulling back and having more of that work-life balance, even though I don't like that word work-life balance. But I think that when I'm hearing these people talk and going to all these professional development things, they're just like, you know, you don't have to grind so hard. And, and I agree to that at this point in my career, but it's only because I did grind so hard in the beginning to build it up. Like, have you noticed a shift in that too? And do you have similar feelings about that? You can probably see visibly my facial expressions. Like (laughs) there is no doubt that everyone misses the grind. Everyone sees you after the fact. And I feel like even the people I'm closest to, you know, friends or whatnot, like they forget that part. Even sometimes my my husband doesn't, but sometimes like, oh, you had an easy day. It's like, right. But I had 12 really hard years or whatever. And I think... That is so relevant. And I think, unfortunately, that's culture, right? Is like you see the singer, this is silly, but like Lainey Wilson, who's a country singer, won a bunch of CMA awards last week. And she said on stage, like, I've been in Nashville 12 years. I'm glad y'all woke up and finally, like, know that I'm here, right? So this girl has been singing and probably on stages and doing all these things. And now 12 years later, she's like getting recognized. And everyone's like, wow, she's amazing. She's like, I've been amazing the last 12 years, right? It's like, we always want to look at it after the fact and after everyone's successful, but no one looks at what goes in and, and that, that part of it. And that is something I get really frustrated with is like that comment of like, well, it's easy for you to say, because you don't have to worry about paying this bill or it's easy for you to say like, but it wasn't always that way. And I know you had a similar situation that there was a point in your life, you were a single mom, you were doing whatever you could to make it work and to make ends meet. And And I think, again, it's so easy that, oh, now Katie's successful and she's got employees and she's doing this and she can go get her hair done in the middle of the day. Right. But it wasn't always that way. And there is an element of like, I need to prove to people like, hey, I've done it. Like I didn't, nothing got handed to me. There's also an element that like haters going to hate, right? Like what, whatever. If they want to think that, they can think that all they want. But I think that you have a chip on your shoulder and so do I. And I think a lot of people who do become successful through years and years of hard work do. It's like you're constantly proving that and we get to enjoy some of the things that go along with that. But there were so many years where we weren't enjoying life because we were so focused on building our careers. And there still is. I think about that. And I will say one thing that I think I'm good at is problem solving and handling tough things. I still have stuff in shitty days, but then I'm like, all right, I'm compensated well. I know how to get through this. This is going to suck. Next week will be better. Right. And I think it's like having that mindset and not letting stress cripple you because I still have stressful things that happen on a daily basis. I just think I do a good job of managing it where you know, I think that's what's also helped my success is that I still have, it's just different stress now that I'm managing 19 people versus when I was owning my own book of business. Absolutely. And that brings me to the next thing I wanted to cover is I know that similar to my career in your career, you have went from being the salesperson to now you are managing the salespeople. What has that transition been like? And what have you learned from it? Yeah, that's a good question. So I still sell a little bit. I probably sell more than I should because I love that way. And I'm very, very competitive person. But I would, I would hope to say, and I think all 19 of my employees really know that I'm an advocate for them. So I had a really, really shitty sales manager in my staffing days. And I learned a lot of what not to do and what not to be. And so 
again, part of it is the hiring. So you want to make sure you have the right people on your team. If you don't have the right people on your team, then they're not coachable and it's really hard to deal with and manage. But if you've got a coachable individual, my crux and what I try to do as a manager is, you know, what do they want to be when they grow up or what part? Because there's a lot of people that I manage that are older than me and want to just be an individual contributor because they don't want to deal with the bullshit of dealing with people, right? But I think I really try to break down the red tape, get stuff out of their way and make their lives as easy as possible so they can sell because that's what they want to do. And that's what they're passionate about. Especially the folks that have no interest in leadership. They make great money because they're selling five, $10 million a year, earning really healthy commissions. Like what do I have to do to get the administrative bullshit out of your way and make your life easier? And so I think that's really what in every single one-on-one what do you need from me right what can I do to make your life easier and that some people's boosting the travel budget other people it's we just you know we're an accounting and advisory firm we just had some new compliance thing come out with how to close deals and people are like this is going to slow me down this is so I'm sitting on a call after this later today to figure out how I can make that easier for my team knowing we have to do it from a compliance standpoint so another thing I wanted to ask you about because I've not familiar with this at all since you were a part of an acquisition of the startup you work for to being taken over by Baker Tilly, which is a huge corporation. And I watched you go through that. I know there were some highs and lows as you were going through that. What was that like? And what did you learn from that process? Yeah. So I feel very fortunate at 34 years old, I feel like I could retire at Baker Tilly. So I want to say that first, that not every acquisition happens like that. That being said, Being on the other side now, as we're acquiring companies and we're bringing people in, there's behaviors that I did that I regret because I think you're a small company and you're super passionate and you feel so proud about what you've built, but maybe you are only a $10 million, $20 million company. And so opening that door to say, hey, Baker Tilly is a $1.5 billion company. Maybe they also know what they're doing and let's mend these things together. It's funny right now as we're acquiring companies, I see that I see owners and employees very set in their ways about how they've done stuff. Well, you're not that company anymore. Now you're Baker Tilly. And so it's time to adapt and build change and and be positive about it. The other thing that I think I would have done different in the early days is being a part of a smaller company. And this, I'd be interested to kind of hear your opinion too. Like both of us in our careers have always external, external networked. Like that's been the part of it. Like I need to know everyone in town. I need to externally network. Well, now I really need to internally network. And I was very naive to think we all have at bakertilly.com at our email addresses. So obviously, right, we're all best friends. We're all going to help each other sell business. Well, that's not the way it works. There's still trust and all these things that need to be built. And so now, again, being a management is a little bit different that I have to focus more internally and network more internally, but I'm still selling just internally in a way. And, And that was something that no one told me. And as we acquire people in and if they end up on my team, I really, really push that because not to take for granted the internal networking and how important that is versus external and just always trying to do that direct B2B sale. Absolutely. I think that's a a really good point. And I have learned that too. And that was one of the learning curves that I had when I started my career as an insurance agency owner. I'd never worked for a large corporation and I'm an independent contractor for a large corporation, so I had to figure out how to work within that corporation. And I will tell you that the internal networking and the other agents and corporate employees have been some of the most helpful people to my career and my development. So that component is so important. When I spent so much time previously, like just focusing on the external networking to sell, 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 but I've there's so much value in the internal piece and the the wisdom that comes from the people that that have done what you're doing or or have a different viewpoint on it. And I think again, maybe this is unique to Baker Tilly, but it's building that trust of well, okay, Molly, maybe your idea from Taliban was good, but I don't know you for anything. And I've been at Baker Tilly 20 years, so this is how we've done stuff. Well, now almost four years later, we've melded a lot of those things together, and it's like okay, I'm not just some young sales girl who doesn't know what she's talking about. I built that trust, but through work and through conversations and getting to know people and showing my worth. Right. And I did not think that was part of, of the role coming into the bigger org. And that's been a huge part of my success and I think growth as well. Yeah. 
So I have another question for you that I've always wondered about. You come from a pretty entrepreneurial background. Your husband owns a successful business. Your brother is an entrepreneur. You're obviously very, very successful in a corporate job. Why have you chosen to go the corporate route versus owning your own business? That's a great question. I just had this conversation last week with our managing partner of digital. I am really, really good at taking direction. So I say this all the time to my brother. Like I, I, not that I don't think I'd be motivated to get up in the morning and get started. And I think I'd still keep a routine of like working out and doing whatever. But then I feel like by one o'clock, I'd be like, okay, I did enough today. I think that's good enough. And so I like having to answer to someone in a weird way, even my husband too, right? Like if there's, there's certain stuff that he asks you to done certain days, but like, if it's like, Hey Greg, I have off next Friday. Like he can take off too. He has that flexibility. I don't know that I would push myself as much. A, a perfect analogy. I work out by myself. I have a gym in my basement. It's great. I push myself, whatever. I was in San Francisco in September and I went to an Orange Theory class where we used to go all the time and I could tell I pushed myself harder, right? Because I'm around people. I like that motivation. I like that competition. I think it's the same thing. I like words of affirmation. I like being told I'm doing good, right? When you're your own boss, you don't necessarily get that all the time. And and I just know I need those things to push forward. The other really cool thing about most sales jobs, and I, I encourage my team this a lot, is that you can still make it very entrepreneurial, but have the umbrella of a safety net. So I have a seller come in and they ask me like, what's the process? What's this? Yeah, there's certain things you have to go through, but I could care less if you make your quota by taking people on the golf course every Friday, by making 500 calls, by going to events, like do what you got to do to get the job done is really my my mentality from a management perspective. And so I think there's still a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in that. But then having that corporate background to know I've got health insurance and all those kind of adult things you just have to have has been satisfying for me. Absolutely. I love that. So tell me more about the women in technology and how that got started. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, I was with Talavant. We are a brand new company. We started in 2015. And per kind of my my conversations earlier, a lot of, you know, I teased the two co-founders, no marketing material, no messaging. They gave me a laptop and said, go sell data and analytics solutions. So I'm like, what the hell does that even mean? Right? Whatever. And so with that, I went to a ton of networking things and stuff that was relevant and stuff wasn't. So I'll give you some examples. Here, living in Madison, there's a ton of stuff around the startup community. Cool. We weren't really a startup. We were a professional services company. It didn't make us any different or unique. We weren't selling a cool gadget like you're selling professional services that people have done that forever. So I'd be going to these events late at night, learning about VC funding and all these things. And I'm like, this is great, but this isn't really relevant. Then I had to go to like Chamber of Commerce events, right? That maybe like for in your business where you're doing more business to consumer, that's more relevant. To me, a financial advisor of Edward Jones is never going to buy 100K plus data and analytics management consulting services. And so I had to kind of figure out what worked and what didn't. And so I stumbled upon this organization in Fox Valley called Women in Technology. And I went to some events. They were early in the morning. I'd get my butt up at 5 a.m. and drive up there on Fridays once a month. And I absolutely loved the networking, the sisterhood, the professional development. It was just really, it was worth my time and enough that I kept going back, even though they were super early in the morning on Fridays. And so you know, as I was kind of looking around, I think it was 2017, 2018, I approached the board and was like, I love what you guys are doing up here. I don't want to reinvent the wheel down in Madison, but we don't have anything like this here. So much so that I brought three female CIOs or directors up to an event with me in, in Fox Valley on a Friday morning. I got their butts up at 445 to prove like we have people here who would do it. Can we do this in Madison? And so it took, I think this conversation started like early 2018. It took till fall of 2019 to help them kind of like relinquish the keys because they had no intentions on growing statewide. They were just doing this in Fox Valley and it worked. September 2019, we had 169 people show up to that first meeting. Wow. So I share that because it shows the gap that we had in the community that, not to pat my own back, but if I didn't raise my hand, like, we may not have had that today. And so still today, um, I sit on the board as past president, but I mean, we had an event this morning, we had 40 plus people show up and variety of different topics of professional development. And I think my biggest passion around it is exactly how we started this conversation. I fell into technology. And while I'm in technology sales and maybe not doing 
computer programming or working, you know, through coding, that's just it. There's so many roles in technology. Our education system and people go to school to say, I'm going to go to school to be a teacher. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to do this. But like the reality is there's a million other careers that aren't in those boxes. You don't go to school to be an insurance agent. And so how do we educate not only the females, but just our younger generations of all these great careers that are high compensation pain and have a lot of those same skill sets that you can transfer. I, I tease a lot of my best friends are teachers and they're like, I could never do project management. Why? You're project managing the classroom all day long. You're taking down tasks. You're managing the students. You're, you know, there's all those sort of things that I'm just so passionate about. And that was also what helps the start of, of the group here in Madison. That's so interesting. So do you have women involved in all facets of technology? It- involved in the group? Yeah. One thing about women in technology is we have three different pillars. So we have WIT for girls. So we have some programming for K through 12 WIT on campus. We have a mentee mentor program. So I actually just hooked up with my mentee from UW-Madison last week. She's a junior in computer science and data engineering. And then we have the WIT at work, which is like that professional pillar. So they range all over. So even those collegiate students, and they range from roles of your true like networking, engineering, maybe you're more hands on the keyboard stuff all the way to management. I mean, we had a CIO at our event today. So it really ranges from a, from a career portfolio. That's so interesting. So other than getting involved with women in technology, I, I'm very fascinated about what you said about networking and that you're, you're trying to sell services that are like $100,000 and up. Where do you find the decision makers other than your involvement in WIT? Where else are you finding these decision makers and meeting them? It's very much relationship based. And so that's where when I talk about those long sales cycles, it's not like I can just call someone, make a decision and they have a need. So back in the Taliban days, I had to get really creative, right? So some of it was through LinkedIn networking. So I would literally, some of my clients would laugh because I would bug them until they would take a meeting with me on LinkedIn. I would meet with them and that would be the first meeting, right? We'd go meet at Breaks or somewhere for coffee and I'd probably have 12 more meetings before I even talked about a statement of work. The other thing is see where they are, right? What events are they going to locally? So there's an event called UW eBusiness Consortium. That's a, a fairly high ticket. I think it's like a grand or something to go to, but there's a lot of CIOs and directors of ITs there. The other thing too is back in the day, I would meet with anyone who would meet with me. So a great example is we have a client in the Beloit area that my stakeholder that I met with was not even a manager at the time. He was, I think, a data architect or something. But he took a meeting with me. So I said, sure. Met with him as a data architect in 2015. Would continue to talk to him, go to lunch. We built rapport, got to know about his family, this and the other. He eventually gets promoted to a manager. We start out small. Now this client's been a $2 million plus client for me for the last six, seven years. So you think about that revenue that's been brought in. So I think the other thing that I would encourage people is take the meeting and say yes. Say yes to everything. I said yes to everything. That's where those longer hours came in. Now I can be pickier. You know, I don't have to go to everything or say yes. But I thought if I can even just see one person there at a user group or at something and I would just source the internet, you know, again, pre-COVID, I think it was a lot easier. People were going to a lot more. But I just said yes to everything. And and sometimes it was a bust and it was like, well, that sucks. I got home at 10 p.m. tonight and it didn't, you know, produce anything. Or sometimes I wouldn't even realize the benefits till three years later, right? Of, oh, I met this person here, didn't think anything of it. And then three years later, they end up being a client. Yeah, I've had a similar situation, you know, as I've developed in my business networking as well. You never know where those relationships are going to go. I've had a lot of real weird, awkward (laughs) coffee meetings. But for all the awkward ones, there's like 10 more good ones that end up being somebody that can help you in business. Even I'm still like, just like reconnecting with people that I met 10 years ago. And now, you know, furthering the relationship. So it's always, always worth it to know as many people as possible. Yeah, it's just shake a lot. I I tease, right? Because post COVID, no one shakes hands, but like shake a lot of hands and kiss a lot of babies, right? Or whatever the president's supposed to do. So yeah, I feel like that has been a huge part and and that like you just want to be well known, especially in your field. So if it's data analytics or IT or healthcare or insurance, like how do you get yourself known and it's showing up and being present? Yeah, absolutely. 
So where do you see yourself growing in your career? You you are at only 34 years old. You've already really climbed the ladder and are at a great place in your career. What do you see the future for yourself? Yeah, thank you. Hopefully early retirement. <laughs> so that's part of it. As, as a dual income, no kids, we uh, would like to retire earlier than, than 65 or whatever the age is. You know, it's interesting. That's an interesting question. And I think I've been in so much like build mode the last. So I was in build mode for Taliban until we sold. And then when I got this promotion in fall of 2020, I've been in build mode since then as well. And, and it's funny you say that because I'm actually at a point right now that I've got the 19 people under me. I To put things in perspective, when I joined Baker Tilly and I got this role in management, I had four people and now I have 19. So that's been a really crazy jump and a lot of it organic of, of hiring the last couple of years. So now that I feel like I've got my team and like the foundation is kind of set, I really love the digital space. I mean, the technology in the digital space, I don't see myself ever managing like the auditor tax salespeople, no offense to them. I just, it's a different world. And I don't know. I mean, I think about my boss as the chief sales officer. I don't know that I'd want his job. He's got like 90 plus people under him. You know, the cool thing about Baker Tilly in the three and a half years that I've been here, we've continued to change and evolve and reorg and, and mix it up. And so I'm confident that the second I get bored, I can raise my hand and say, I want more and I'll get it. But continue in sales, some sort of sales leadership. Again, I, I don't see myself leaving this organization. And I feel confident saying that as someone who has seen a lot of organization from the selling side, unless some really crazy drastic thing happened like with leadership or culture. But yeah, sales leadership, continue that. I don't know. That's I've honestly haven't thought about that. So that's a good question. Well, that's good. That means you're super happy. <laughs> um, I want to I got another question for you around your team. I did not realize that your team grew that much. And I do know just from knowing you that you do have team members all over the world. Mm -hmm. Like what has that been like to manage a team that's growing so quickly, but also dealing with people from all different cultures and time zones and very different markets? Yeah, it's challenging, right? The other thing is I have very wide spectrum. So I had someone who had only had like two years out of college, didn't know how to even use like Microsoft Outlook or some of the tools that we use all the way to someone who's like been selling a long time and has no interest in having a 34 year old boss, right? And so managing in between, I think the biggest thing that I've learned with every single person is like what motivates them and what makes them tick. So for some people, a lot of people, it's money, we work in sales, but for others, it's that word of affirmation. It's that pat on the back. It's that hey, by the way, go leave at one o'clock on a Friday or whatever it may be. I think the other thing too is truly trying to be an active listener and empower them. And that's something I feel like I'm learning more recently is when people come to me with questions and that's what I feel like my world is, is just like, it's like a fly swatter, like question, swat it, question, swat it. And said like, well, how, how would you, how would you react to that? Like Molly doesn't have all the answers. Like, and that helps empower them to then say, oh yeah, because all my teams are different. They're all selling different things. And so it's like, well, you're in the weeds day in and day out. So how would you react to that and own that? Uh, and that's something that I've adopted more recently. And, and it does make me pause because I'm used to just solving. Like I ask anyone who knows me, I love to just solve the problem. But instead of saying, well, no, well, what would you do? And then that makes them stop and think. So it's been interesting, again, to your earlier point to know that I'd be here at 34, especially coming from such a, such a small org. Even in November 2020, when the leadership said, oh, yeah, we'll help you grow your team, like, you don't always believe that. And they have proved it. And then some. The different culture side of it is interesting. I mean, the UK is, is where my team members are that you're referring to. And that's not super unique compared to US. You know, I think it could be a lot, a lot different. But it's, it's been fun more than anything, I have to say. Like, I feel like it's been exciting and and. Lots of different personalities. That's a lot of my job is just managing personalities. And and again, it's not just my team. It's then the partners who are helping support. So it's like this managing up and managing down game that I get to play every half an hour on a different call. Well, I think also with having team in other parts of the world, I've seen you be able to travel. You recently went to London for some stuff and you're always traveling all over the U.S. for your career. I think that's something that we don't talk about too with corporate careers. I think that sometimes you get tired of the travel and it can get to be too much, but it's also a really exciting opportunity. Have you enjoyed that portion of the job? 
Yeah, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. I mean, growing up, we really never traveled. Like, Wisconsin Dells was our big trip, which we loved and everything. But the fact that now I have been, and I actually just counted the other day, like, how many different states I've been to, different food and cuisines I've been able to try. I'm actually going back to London in January again, so I just found that out last week. It's really, really neat. I also, at the same time, I'm a whole body. So it's just, like, I feel like once I'm there, I'm good. I, like... Don't get anxious, but I'm like, oh, I have to travel this week or fly out or get home late or whatever. I love a routine. Anyone who knows me knows I love a routine. So that gets mixed up. But I feel like once I'm physically there, I'm fine. And I'm so busy when I travel for work. I mean, I'm going to Boise, Idaho in two weeks. And I literally like land, dinner, meetings all day Tuesday, dinner, breakfast, fly home. So it's like boom, boom, boom. So I don't usually even have time to think much less like explore which is good and bad right Um, yeah but it's been it's been really it's been really cool and also just weird because I was the girl who like maybe flew once a year to Florida if that and now it's a feels like a monthly thing that I'm going somewhere and it's different for sure yeah so what are some of the other unexpected perks that have come along with with this career path that you've chosen Yeah. So I think the biggest thing too, in like sales, I think specifically is again, a lot of that independence that you can build for yourself. Right. So obviously I have some days, most days that I'm in a lot of meetings and answering to team members or partners or things like that. But there's also a lot of autonomy and creativity that I think I get to do that I probably don't share enough about and parts of my brain that I love using of like, go solve this problem and deal with this. Baker Tilly also, like I've repeated, has a very entrepreneurial spirit. So even though we're an old, I mean, I tease because when we talked about getting acquired, I was like, I don't want to go work for an old accounting company. Like that sounds freaking horrible. And now I'm like, that's not the case at all. It's extremely entrepreneurial. It's very much like if, hey, if it doesn't work, let's fix it. Let's change it. Let's innovate and things like that. So that's been cool. Obviously the travel, I think too, like, the bonus structure and compensation, if I'm being honest, I was just talking about a month ago with an individual who also sells or did here in Madison and her and her husband now are starting their own individual kind of sales consulting gig. And she's like, we won't ever see a big bonus check again, like unless we scale out or unless we write higher board people. And so it's those type of things that you ask, like, why did I do corporate versus independent? I mean, I there's those safety nets that are not like I, I, I recognize that they're there and I appreciate that. Yeah. And you have the framework and you know what you have to do to like take advantage of it and get it done. Exactly. Yeah. I like that. Like I said, I like to be told what to do. And even though I also like to, you know, manage, it's a weird, weird thing in my head. So I, I want you to tell me more about your mentorship. I know you're mentoring a, a young lady at that's going to college right now. I, I know you're super passionate about that and helping the next generation of women in technology get the confidence to build their careers the way that you have. What are you doing with that? What do you hope to to see come out of that? Yeah. I mean, again, a lot of this stuff has been tied to women in technology. I actually just last week got approved to be on the board internally at Baker Tilly. So as a pod leader for our own internal kind of women network and and to grow that, I have a mentee within Baker Tilly as well. She's a, a newer hire who has reached out to me. And so we have monthly meetings. And again, kind of the same thing I do with the team. It's like, what do you have for me? What do you need for me? And a lot of that is just navigating or helping answer questions or look at things a different way. I think good and bad. One thing that has also helped in my success is I've never been afraid to ask or to go for it. And not everyone's like that. And I recognize that. But I think you can do that in a tactful way. And that's what I really encourage in my mentoring is if you want that raise, you can ask it without being an asshole. Or if you're curious about what the growth looks like for your, for you and the organization, you can ask it in a way that doesn't feel like you're leaving or threatening or, or things like that. And so I think that's you know, a lot of what my conversations stem from is, you know, how do I do this? Or how do I ask for this? Because I I am just confident. And I'm, I've, I've always gone for it. And even if I haven't got it, like I, I, it, I seek to understand why and where that's coming from. And so giving people that confidence and that appropriateness to ask for it in the right way. All right. Well, I absolutely love that, Molly. I know that you are probably an amazing mentor to the women that you help. What what else do you want to share before we close out the podcast? Just to women out there who are considering a career in technology or sales, what would what would your best advice be, just in a general way? 
yeah, I think even broader, you know, to, to women who maybe who aren't even in the sales or technology realm, like I'm such a big believer that life is so short and, you know, to your point, when you ask, well, where do you see your future? I'm like, I don't know. I'm loving life now and just grinding it out and figuring out, like, I want everyone to feel that way. And I do feel like we have the power as individuals to do that. Now, some people have more privilege to be able to get there faster, to be able to, to figure out what that road looks like. But everyone has the same opportunity in that sense. And I'm very, very passionate about that. And so, you know, if you don't know where to start or you feel like, gosh, I would love to be in a role in technology or I'd love to go into insurance sales or whatever, do your research, go network, go reach out to people on LinkedIn. With the internet today in 2023 and the access to social media and YouTube and Google, like the resources are endless. When I started selling in 2011, they didn't even have audiobooks unless I wanted to put a cassette tape in my car, which I don't even think it had it, to listen to it. So go buy an audiobook, listen, figure stuff out, and be an active learner. I mean, I think one thing that I've always done is learn and, and be curious and want more, whether it's my nutrition, my health, my job, my family, my life, my everything. I, I want to and, and be 10 out of 10 in everything I do. And so I think maybe just my final thoughts is, Whatever it is in life, if it's the job, if it's the relationship, if it's whatever, like you can have it. You just, you, you create that own destiny for yourself, which sounds so like fluffy and so like woo woo. But I really think that it's possible. You just have to put your mind to it, create a plan, create steps and crawl, walk, run, right? Like you, you can all get there and do it. And I think you're a great example of that as well. And I just, I want people to be empowered to feel that way. Because for whatever reason, I have been, again, I, a lot of confidence for my parents and things like that and my husband, but but everyone has it in them. They just have to kind of reach for it. I love that. And I could not agree more. So if any of our listeners want to get in touch with you, where is the best place to find you, Molly? Yeah, probably I'd say LinkedIn from a professional perspective. So Molly Gallmeyer, you can look me up on the pro- on my profile. If you don't mind, just send a little message so I know that you're not trying to sell me something as a salesperson. I hate being sold stuff. <laughs> so so yeah, I'd say LinkedIn. I mean, I have an Instagram, but I don't post a ton of professional stuff on there. So I'd say LinkedIn is probably the best. All part. right. We'll have that linked in the show notes. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Molly. It was yeah. wonderful to have a discussion with you. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Off the Beaten Career Path podcast is a Lit Path Studios production and is produced by Jamie Gale and Katie Myers. Music is by Sasha Gray and Pond5. If you enjoyed today's show, please leave us a review and share it to your social media. Remember, your career path is up to you to create. Keep exploring, keep pushing boundaries, and keep blazing your own trail.